Hello everyone and welcome to your Glassnode video report for the week on chain week 27. We're recording this on the 6th of July 2021. So this week we really focused on the mining migration that's going on, what we're calling the great hash power migration. And what we're trying to provide here is a bit of context and looking at the on-chain data to understand the magnitude of how large this migration actually is. So what we're going to look at is a lot of the on-chain data that relates to the mining market, some of the mining dynamics. We look at things like block intervals, look at hash rate, look at difficulty multiples, just to get a bit of a feel for what the estimated impact actually is and how much of the actual hash power is currently on the move or what our best estimate is of that. And we'll also look at things like the minor revenue and some of the logistical costs incurred because we have a very interesting dynamic where approximately 50% of the hash power is currently offline and incurring a great number of costs due to logistics and just simply not being hashing, having hardware that's not currently working. And the other 50% has essentially seen half of their competition drop off the network. So whilst the protocol is now issuing the same number of coins that it regularly does, having difficulty now wound down, we're now in a situation where half of the network has doubled their income and the other half of the network is essentially producing nothing. So it's this very interesting dynamic and what we're looking for is what is the potential risk and what is the magnitude of potential sell pressure um, or otherwise accumulation pressure that we may see from the mining market. And within that, we'll also look at some of the nuances and some of the on-chain metrics. So there's a number of different indicators that may flash certain signals, certain indicators, but what we really need to do is correct some of that for some of the immense amount of changes that's going on in terms of the hash power. What happens when blocks actually slow down is you see a reduction in the overall issuance over that uh, period of time. So it's really about understanding the mining market and some of the dynamics that are going on to fully appreciate what these metrics are telling us. So let's jump across to Glassnode Studio and we'll get started with the report. So here we are in Glassnode Studio. We're looking at our week on chain dashboard. Now, whilst this week we've really seen volatility seeping out of the pricing market, we trade in a fairly narrow range of about 32,000 to the upper 36,000 this week. What we have seen is a lot more volatility going on in the mining space. And this is a truly impressive uh, event that's going on is this, this mining migration that's coming out of China. As many, many miners are now looking for relocating, reallocating their capital, moving their hardware to somewhere else to actually reestablish their businesses. Some of them are waiting on the sidelines, just waiting for the dust to settle to see whether they can reestablish their operations. It's a really, really complex and very, very large shift in the market. And there's very few industries that can really see this degree of their industrial base pick up and move or essentially relocate their, their capital and their hardware with generally minimal disruption. So we saw some slightly slower block times. Uh, what we've got here is our mean block interval. So just for those who don't know, at a protocol level or at a on-chain level, Bitcoin really only knows about the block interval. So what is the timestamp that miners are encoding into the block header and the mining difficulty? So these are the two on-chain parameters that we have. We can then using those two as inputs, we can derive an estimated hash rate or a mean hash rate. So the way that we actually calculate this, we look at our mining difficulty, which is fixed over a 14 day period. We then look at what the overall block times that are coming in, what is the, the typical or the average protocol uh, block time that's coming in. We can then use that to back out and back calculate what the estimated hash rate is in order to achieve that block interval under this particular mining difficulty. So the, the protocol hash rate is actually an estimate. So in terms of looking for purely accurate information, we generally would rely on block interval and difficulty to understand what's going on at the base level. We can then use that to imply a hash rate. So prior to the difficulty adjusting down, as we see hash power coming off the network, the mean block interval starts to slow. And what we saw this week was actually the longest average block time on a 24 hour rolling window in all history. Essentially, you have to go back to 2009 when Bitcoin was mined on CPUs and before it even had a price to find a block time that was this slow on a 24 hour basis. So really we're talking about in all of Bitcoin's modern history and all the time where Bitcoin has had pricing markets and really was outside the bootstrapping phase of 2009, 2010, we had to go all that way back to find a block time that was this slow. And this gives us a bit of a scale on just how large this shift in the mining market really is. Now, if we then revert that back to mean hash rate. So hash rate is a derivative. We mentioned that block interval and difficulty are protocol core metrics. 
the hash rate is then estimated using those two instances. So we have a mining difficulty, which is the complexity of the puzzle to be solved. We then have the speed at which blocks are being solved under that difficulty regime. We can then use that to estimate what is the overall hash power that is on the network. So let's take an estimate as to what our maximum hash power that was on the network prior to this sell-off and prior to the mining ban coming in in China. If we look back to around April to early May, the hash rate was roughly around 180 to 160 exahash per second. So that gives us a bit of an idea of the total number of machines that were operational at that period of time. Now, since we've had our price sell off by approximately 50%, and we've then had the mining ban come in and miners start to switch off out of necessity, where we're now trading in the current range, and again, this may change over the coming weeks, but where we are at the moment is about 88 to 110 exahash per second, which gives us from our 180 exahash baseline at the top, that gives us roughly around 38 to 49% drawdown in the total number of miners. So if we take the upper bound of that, we can say that approximately on an estimate of the current day, about 50% of the market is currently offline, which gives us a scale of just how large this migration really is. Now we saw the largest downwards difficulty of mining, uh, the mining protocol down 28% this week. We're estimating that there's going to be another about 13% at the current time, downwards difficulty adjustment. So the reason that we're estimating about 50% of mining power off the network, but the difficulty adjustment was only 28%, is because the difficulty adjustment is measuring over that 14-day window. And over the 14-day window, we can see that the, the overall block time actually accelerated to the downside. So we're seeing an increasing number of longer and longer blocks but the front end of that 14 day window has slightly faster blocks. So on average, the Bitcoin protocol estimated about a 20% downshift was necessary. And it's therefore gonna take a number of weeks, depending on how hash rate trades, even if it starts to stabilize, if it stabilizes at this level for the next uh, 14 day period, then likely the next difficulty adjustment will return it to equilibrium and we'll start seeing that 10 minute block time. If, however, we start to see more hash power coming offline, or in the converse, we actually see hash power coming back online when those machines get relocated, then the difficulty adjustment will take a number of weeks to actually find out what is the happy medium, what is the equilibrium that it's gonna take. So it is quite a interesting market that it's going to take time, and the rate of response for the mean hash rate, how long it takes to actually start to revert, will give us some indication as to the, the amount of time or how prolonged miners in China are currently under financial stress because at the moment they're not producing any income. Their machines are essentially sitting there without producing, a, you know, they're not costing uh, OPEX, but they certainly have debt and CAPEX obligations that remain in play. So those machines are currently unproductive. And the faster that they can get back online, the sooner that the income stress will start to deviate. So this will tell us the mean hash rate as it starts to recover. That will tell us how quickly these miners are actually getting their hardware back into operation and potentially helping revert that headwind risk of perhaps having more sell pressure from their treasury. So the longer that the hash rate remains depressed, the more likely that income stress is going to lead to treasuries having to be spent. Now, just finally on the protocol level, so the difficulty ribbon is an interesting metric that Willy Wu established a number of years ago. And what it was really designed to look at is minor capitulations, in particular at the end of bear markets. So we saw this at the end of the 2018 bear market. We saw it twice in 2020, first after the halving of price in March 2020, then again after the protocol halving. So that really reduced the aggregate income for miners by 50% twice back to back. After the 2018 bear market, obviously it's been an extended period of depressed pricing. So what happens with the difficulty ribbon is we're looking at the faster moving averages, the nine day and the 14 day, when they dive underneath the slower moving averages, the 128 day and the 200 day. And what this is really indicating is when is there income stress in the mining market and when are miners having to switch off their machines? Now, when some miners have to switch off their machines, what that effectively does is it increases the number of coins that are gained by the miners who remain operational because the same number of deterministic coins are issued based on the overall monetary policy for Bitcoin. So because the difficulty is adjusting up and down to make sure that that deterministic issuance remains in play, the miners who remain on the network are spending the same amount on their hardware costs and on their electricity costs, but the amount of coins that they're earning per hash starts to increase. 
So really what the difficulty ribbon is telling us is when we're getting that income squeeze, when some of those miners are experiencing an income squeeze, and that also means that other miners are actually gaining in hash share and therefore are able to sell fewer of their coins. Now we're in a very interesting scenario here where it could be a very prolonged period of time until the hash rate starts to come back online. And that's really how we can use this dashboard and these metrics to really track how this, this migration and how quickly and how, or how slowly the mining hardware can get back online because the longer that that income stress remains in play, the more likely miners in China will have to liquidate treasuries to cover their obligations and cover their costs. So this is where we can jump into looking at miner revenues, which as I mentioned, there's about 50% of the mining market that we estimate to be offline at the current time. And that means that the other 50% has essentially seen half of their competition drop off. So we're in this very interesting dynamic where half of the miners are incurring extraordinary logistical costs and opportunity costs by their hardware not hashing. And the other half of the market is actually seeing their revenues approximately double. So where we were back in April, when we were trading in the $55,000, $60,000 range, we saw aggregate miner income, so across the entirety of the mining market, somewhere between $50 and $60 million per day. So since that point, we've obviously had a approximately 50% price correction. We've traded down from 60,000 to roughly 30,000. And that means that the aggregate mining income, purely from the block issuance, is coming out at roughly 25 to $30 million per day. So whilst the overall revenue has essentially halved, the miners who remain operational have seen half of their, their competition drop off the network. So the profitability of miners who remain online at this point in time has actually reverted back to somewhere similar to where we were at the all-time high zone. So this is a very interesting dynamic where half of the miners are incurring huge costs, half of them just saw their income essentially double. So what we can then look at is what kind of sell pressure we're seeing on aggregate. So we have two metrics here. One is the minor outflow multiple, and the other one is the minor unspent supply. So the minor unspent supply is essentially looking at all of the Coinbase transactions. When a miner mines a fresh block, there's a special transaction called the Coinbase transaction, which includes the newly issued coins. So what we're looking at with the minor unspent supply is summing up all of the total unspent Coinbase transactions, or essentially coins that have been mined and have never moved. Now, just note that on the axis here, we're up in the 1.7-ish million coins. This does include the early coins that were mined by Satoshi because they remain coin-based transactions and they're also going to be early miners from very early on who very likely have lost those keys. Some of them will still have them, but some of those will also be lost. So just bearing in mind when we're looking at this axis, this includes all coin-based transactions that remain unspent. So what's really key to look at in this particular metric is the trend. When we have a downtrend in unspent supply, it means that miners are by and large selling more coins and they're, so they're mining a certain amount and they're selling more than they're holding onto, right? There is a net outflow of unspent coins. Conversely, when we have an uptrend, it means that miners are essentially accumulating. They're selling less than they're holding. And what we've seen is that during 2020, we saw a fairly dramatic increase in the overall unspent supply. So miners were clearly accumulating, likely in response to the monetary uh, environment and the macro environment that Bitcoin found itself in. We saw a large amount of distribution as we rallied up into the $42,000 first peak. And then we actually reverted back into a zone of accumulation. Now that has started to slow down. We've started to see a softening of this gradient and a number of these treasuries appear to have been liquidated in the, this recent consolidation. So this is certainly one to watch. Do we continue with this uptrend in a macro sense? Does it start to revert to a downtrend suggesting that miners are in fact stressed and need to offload more of their coins to cover their costs? Or do we start to trend sideways, which is really saying that for all the coins that are coming in, the same amount of coins are being held onto. So the trend of this metric is gonna provide us a bit of insight to this. Now the minor outflow multiple really tries to capture this in a bit of an oscillator and it will spike higher when we're seeing a over, um, relative to the, the previous year, the last 365 days, how many coins are being spent. So it's a relative metric that's looking at what is the spending behavior today relative to the previous year. Now what we saw is that same behavior. We saw a significant spike in the minor outflow multiple as we rallied in this bull market. We've then seen a resumption of this downtrend, which is suggesting that overall, there is more coins being held onto and the minor spending behavior is actually declining. Now, will we actually see this start to trend higher? If it starts trending higher, that would tell us that yes, miners are actually spending and it will correlate largely to our unspent supply trending down. 
So between these two metrics, we can start to see what that balance is between miners who have to spend their treasuries out of necessity and miners who remain on the network live at the moment, who are currently operating a very, very high profitability somewhere like where we were back in April, and potentially will be able to sell far fewer of their coins and hold on to a lot more. And just to close out, we'll look at uh, the Pule multiple, which is a very interesting metric that flashes green uh, this week. However, it's only done this on a very, very select few number of times. And quite often, the pure multiple will flash green at the same time as the difficulty ribbon will invert. They tend to correlate with very, very large capitulation events, historic events that are typically generational bottoms of some form. So the pure multiple is calculated as the aggregate US dollar revenue. So the revenue that we have coming in for miners in US dollars per day divided by its 365 day or its yearly average. So what we're looking at there is what is the overall income today relative to the yearly average? So this will trend higher when miners are very, very profitable and relative to their yearly average making a lot more money, and it will trend down when they're making a lot less relative to their yearly average. So as we noted, the overall issuance of blocks slowed down substantially this week. And on the 28th of July, we actually hit an all-time low of daily inflation rate, which is 0.71%. So what that actually means is that instead of the 144 blocks that Bitcoin typically mines on a daily basis, we only saw 58 blocks mined. And what that's really telling us is that fewer coins were issued that day. Now, when fewer coins are issued, naturally, minor income is also going to fall, particularly relative to the slow one-year moving average. And therefore, our pure multiple actually dipped down into this undervalued zone before quickly reverting as a result of the difficulty adjustment changing the complexity of the puzzle and adjusting it so that the current mining hash power was more suitable to the puzzle to be solved. So we saw the issuance then spike back higher. We saw our inflation rate return back into the stable deterministic range. And it really goes to show how there has to be some nuance and understanding of how these metrics are put together um, to fully understand what this signal means and whether it's actually a technicality or whether it's genuinely flashing a capitulation style event. So in terms of the pure multiple, we've recently refreshed our Glassnode Academy instance for this, and we include a lot of details not only on the pure multiple and how to understand it, but certainly on the mining market itself, because the pure multiple is really capturing a lot of dynamics and a very simple indicator on what's going on in the aggregate mining space. So it talks about a number of elements like when miners have to be have greater profitability, when they have reduced profitability, and what are the overall impacts of that business that are then reflected in something like the pure multiple. So thanks for listening in. I hope you enjoyed this session and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Cheers.